Rat Pack was a phenomenon, a kind of lifestyle. I'll give them a party, you make the drinks. The guys were the coolest, Frank and Sammy and Dean. Nobody touches them. They had character, man. They had style. Steady as down country lover, good boy. These guys swung. They came with a soundtrack. The original Ocean's Eleven is the first time that the Rat Pack appeared in a film, and it's great fun because those guys were the epitome of cool. On the simplest level, the Rat Pack was Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, Joey Bishop, entertaining people together in Las Vegas and in a couple of movies. And it's a really perfect mix, and they were only together a brief time. It was sort of the perfect confluence. It's just one of those things that could only happen once, you know? And Frank ran the party. He was the leader of the Rat Pack, period. Frank Sinatra was the biggest single star in the world in 1960. He was an extremely prolific recording artist. He was on television. He performed in nightclubs. And he was a sex symbol. All right, girls, time for your nap. Beat it. Hey. See you later. So if you were a young person, 19 years old, Frank Sinatra was hit. At that point in time, they were referring to Frank as the chairman of the board, the, the king of show business. He could pick up a phone and, and make or break someone's career. But he cared for his people across the board. If you were his friend, he wanted to be a one-man army for you. But the other side of the coin, when he was done with you, you might as well be at Forest Lawn because you're not going to get him to answer the phone. This is a recording. You've dialed the right number. Now, please hang up and don't do it again. <laughs> the key with Sinatra was everybody wanted to be near him because they never had a better time. And he collected very, very high-toned friends, you know, very, very elegant A-list Hollywood buddies. Frank just wanted to be with his friends. And he said, what, what do I like to do? I want to entertain, uh, and I want to get paid for it, and I want to laugh while I'm doing it and which of my buddies can help me with that. So he found an incredible group of guys. Dean Martin was a successful recording artist and had begun a substantial movie career with the Young Lions and some came running. I don't fit into your picture, huh? From here on in, you don't, sweetheart. Sammy Davis Jr. was a big recording star and a huge star of the stage. The 11 of us cats against this one little city? <laughs> We're an overlay. Peter Lawford was a well-known B-movie actor, and he was married to a Kennedy. What a way to make a living. And Joey Bishop was a young and rising comedian. So this was quite a variety of people to have associated together. They used to sort of show up at each other's shows and come on stage and do their little riffs, and then they just realized it was the most fun they were ever having. And boom, that's how it started. In their performances, the chaos, and their cool, unflappable, good time Charlie response to it is the secret sauce. And so it's the hottest ticket in town. And if you can get in, you enjoy it. If you didn't get in, you say you did. Frank, with all of his playful grandiosity, always referred to it as the summit. And that was the formation. That's really where, where it all started kicking into place. That's when Frank said, we're going to make a movie and put all my friends in it. We're going to do it in Vegas. And while we're there, we'll do some shows at night. And the legend was born. You have to remember also that Sinatra was a businessman. Frank had the hotel. And he had the production company, Essex Pictures. So when they came across a script about a group of World War II veterans who hold up Vegas casinos, it was this perfect kismet of business interests and opportunities to travel, perform, film. So January 1960, they started filming Ocean's Eleven and then playing the Sands Hotel Copa Room in the evening. Because a film and the summit happened all but simultaneously. It ratcheted up the excitement level in that town as nothing ever had. It was mayhem. These guys were coming to do a couple of shows at night. They were packing the place. And when every celebrity showed up, politician showed up, JFK was there, Marilyn Monroe, Shirley MacLaine, every star of the day showed up and it became an event. I was uh, around for the first Ocean's Eleven in 1960, while Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, and the whole crew were working, doing two shows a night, finishing about 2 a.m., 
hang out until 6.30, showing up at the set, getting made up, and shooting until they needed to take a nap and a massage. If you're not careful, buddy boy, she'll rub you out. These guys would show up noon, one, two, three, four, five. They'd shoot around them, so they would do what they want. Frank never liked to do a lot of takes. When he got the first take, he was, did you get it? Good, moving on. So these are guys that are not known for their disciplined adherence to other people's needs or schedules. Get them up, get them up. But what I loved about the first oceans was that they captured this sense that they really were having fun off camera, that they were genuinely friends, and that translates on the screen. I think the only reason why I got into this cape is so I could see you again. Sounds like a hell of a price, and I agree with you. I'm worth it. You're just in time for the jokes. They liked living large. Frank had a saying, that you, you gotta love living, baby, because dying's a pain in the ass. And all of his pals, they were all the same way. And they played off each other. There was a frat club aspect to it. It's fun time, Jimmy boy. There were certain restaurants they ate in. There were drinks that you ordered and drinks that you would never order. And they also had a few little slang words. Believe me, I like to swing like the rest of you guys, but you haven't got a plan here. You got a pipe load. They spoke in a language all their own. You're talking on a dead phone, Charlie. The ring-a-ding sort of patois. Well, I married you once and it didn't work out too well, so what's wrong with a little hey-hey? They all were in search of a little hey-hey, which meant have their way with ladies. Or they would avoid men who seemed to be drippy. They'd call them Clydes. I got a date in the casino. Here's your keys. You're wasting, you're wasting your time with that Clyde, honey. He's a loser. He's a loser. A lot of them were based on teasing each other. I mean, I'm sure you know Frank called Sammy Smokey because he never stopped. I have no fear little Josh is here. Frank called Dino Dag, but they could call each other that. Nobody else could. It was silly, but they did it. And, you know, anyone who did it and wasn't part of the group would look like an even bigger ass, I think is part of the point. Hello, Jimmy Foster here. Are you there? There was always some adolescent joke going on. <laughs> You're a spoiled sport. And so a lot of the film was a glimpse into their world. This is our objective. Las Vegas, Nevada. Mission? To liberate millions of dollars. I've always looked at Ocean's Eleven as, a, as an essential how-to film. This has nothing to do with the plot. It had more to do with them being them. And so this is a caper minus suspense, but full of something even richer. It's full of attitude. You realize how wrong you are. Use that. And it, it turns out to be one of these great iconic moments in male film swagger. How'd your action go? If it went any easier, I'd been ashamed. Take the money. Good boy, get lost now. And the one thing I respect about the whole movie was their mannerism, their style, the cigarette, the drink, the booze. They look big time. You know what I mean? They all had a kind of a look about them, a cohesion to the way they dressed, which is very important to the movie. Sinatra believed if you didn't wear midnight blue or black after dark, you were a hick. And all these guys followed the pattern to a T. They took great pride in the way they presented themselves to the general public. And if you watch any of Dean Martin's shows, his tuxedos, his suits, the button was always in the vicinity or below his navel so that when he moved, the jacket didn't open like this. Sammy Davis was the one that wore the tightest suits. He was probably the trendiest in a way. Front Sinatra was the, the hat guy and the sort of skinny tie. And Peter Lawford was the sort of elegant, midnight blue, one button suit. Always, always immaculate, very simple. So these guys are clearly snappier dresses than everybody else. Those brothers are they, they had character, man, even to the point where they lost the money. How they were disappointed, but they were so cool when they looked around at each other. You know, and they went down the line. They're so cool that most people forget that ending that they didn't get the money. They forget. They just think, oh, look how cool this is. They're walking down the strip. It doesn't even matter because the movie is not that good, but we don't care. All we care about is just seeing our guys, you know? And it's like, oh, look how great they look in those outfits. I gotta get me one of them side of war suits.
And it's great to see Vegas, to see these shots, these driving shots where there are two hotels and that's it. I mean, it's just a couple of buildings and desert. If you watch the original Ocean's Eleven, you will have a tendency to say, geez, you would think that Sinatra would have spent more money on the sets. And then when you tell them, wait, no, that was shot on location, that's what Vegas looked like then. That blows their mind. So it's a time capsule. Silver dollars, please. But in terms of the history of Vegas, the Rat Pack Summit is one of the most crucial events. There were hotels closing in the years prior to the Rat Pack. But then you hit the summit, and that's when Vegas became Vegas. You know, Las Vegas is like Paris in a way. You always run into people you know. There was a sense that all eyes were on Vegas, and that it was a playground for adults. What Walt Disney was trying to do in Anaheim, Frank Sinatra did first in Vegas. And that's a big part of their legacy. Old timers in Las Vegas will tell you that those guys did more for this town than anyone except the guy who invented air conditioning in the airplane. I always had it in my mind that with the growth of Las Vegas and the fact that I have so many friends there that own hotels and I know everybody in the town, that someday I'd be able to remake this picture and make it a whole different way. None of us felt like we wanted to compare ourselves to them, because in this case, you can't beat that. Most of the time, they'll go, you know, George Clooney's playing Frank Sinatra, and you go, no, no, no. And there will, of course, be all those comparisons, but we won't hold a candle to the guys, and we won't ever be that cool. But that's OK. You know, no one's supposed to. Or did you guys get a group rate or something? When Ocean's Eleven came out, obviously it was a remake, but they'd carved out their own footprint clearly enough that it was okay to just give a little bit of a gentle nod to the past with Ocean's 13. There's a code amongst guys that shook Sinatra's hand. Screw Sinatra's hand. Screw what Sinatra represents. It was really important in Ocean's 13. The idea that if you're old time enough to have known Frank, you look after each other and you do the right thing. You shook Sinatra's hand. You should know better, really. Frank lived his life the way he lived it, and other people thought that was cool. And these guys have done a masterful job bringing it into today and trying to capture the essence of that camaraderie and that fun <laughs> and that sense of style. But the original Ocean's Eleven such a hard act to follow but because they look like they belong together. They were just like that every day. And it gives them a kind of an esprit de corps. I'm certainly not going to let you boobs try and pull this job without your best man. They was like the three musketeers, you know. They always for one, one fall. It's the closest thing we'll ever have to a home movie of the Rat Pack at play. So if you want to go pretend, that's the one you want to go put on. But I'd advise you to find an orange mohair sweater, because Frank always thought orange was the happiest color. So it would make him happy to know viewers were out there wearing orange watching Ocean's Eleven. I wouldn't have it any other way. 